All right, welcome everyone to today's TCS Plus talk. Uh, we're very excited to have Henry Yuan here today as our speaker. Um, before we get to him, let me just mention uh, that uh, our next talk will be two weeks from now. Thomas Steinke will be speaking about uh, a nice and very exciting new paper, Reasoning About Generalization via Conditional Mutual Information. Um, yeah, um, but without further ado, let's, uh, let me introduce Henry Yuan in today's uh, uh, talk. So Henry Yuan is a professor at uh, the University of Toronto. Uh, he, before that, he was at uh, UC Berkeley for a postdoc, and before that, he did his PhD at MIT. As I'm sure pretty much all of you know, uh, you know some of the things he works on include quantum and complexity. Uh, in particular, we're here today for a talk on both these things. Uh, but he also has some interest in cryptography. Uh, he's the winner of uh, many awards, including, uh, for example, he's, been, he's currently a Simons Fellow at the Simons Institute of, uh, for Serious Computing. Uh, but before that also, he was, uh, uh, during grad school, he, was a Simons, uh, he won a Simons Graduate Fellowship. He recently won a Google, uh, a Google Research Award of sorts um, and is a recipient of an NSERC Discovery Grant. Um, but without further ado, I, like, he's, this is a really exciting result uh, on MIT star equals RE, and uh, I'm going to let Henry take it away. All right. Uh, thanks, Gaudu. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, feel free to share your slides now. OK. Uh, how does this work? OK, cool. So uh, yeah, thanks, Gautam. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for uh, attending this talk. Um, it's a, a really nice opportunity to, to present on this um, really wonderful resource that is TCS+. Um, so uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about this result, uh, MIP star equals RE. And this is joint work with uh, Zhang Feng Ji, uh, Anand uh, Natarajan, uh, Toma Vidic, and John Wright. Okay, so uh, this talk is going to be focused on uh, the connection between uh, two questions that are seemingly very different from each other. Um, one of the problems uh, called the Kahn embedding problem uh, asks, um, do all separable 2-1 factors embed in an ultra power of the hyperfinite 2-1 factors? Uh, so this is a question that originates from uh, the theory of von Neumann algebras, um, a, a branch of pure mathematics. Um, and if you don't know what a separable uh, type 2-1 factor is, uh, don't worry, I won't mention it uh, anymore in this talk. Um, but uh, you know, there's this other question um, which concerns the power of this complexity class MIP star. And the question there is, what problems have interactive proofs involving quantum entangled provers? So two very different questions from very different areas, um, but there's a very strong connection between them. Um, and it turns out, um, somewhat surprisingly, that a yes answer to this abstract question from operator algebras uh, would imply that this complexity class MIP star is computable. Okay, so that's the connection. Uh, and what we show is that MIP star is equal to RE, uh, which means that MIP star is not computable. And therefore, the answer to the Kahn embedding problem is no. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, explain what this uh, connection is, how, how it comes about. So this connection between the Kahn embedding problem, quantum physics, and uh, computation. Um, and uh, then I'll explain how we prove this uncomputability result uh, for something called non-local games um, via a technique that is, uh, we call recursive compression. Uh, and if there's a uh, time at the end, I'll try to give a glimpse of what this compression technique uh, is about. Um, and uh, I'll try to keep this talk as uh, high level as possible to tr try to put the pieces together. Um, so I won't assume any background in, in quantum information or um, uh, complexity theory. Um, so feel free to, uh, to, to stop me and ask if you have any questions. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to start off with this uh, by explaining something called non-local games, uh, which are tests for correlations between separated physical systems. Right, so first I have to explain what a correlation is. 
Um, a correlation uh, is a mathematical uh, model for a physics experiment where you have two separated physical systems, you know, say, let's say a black box here and the black box here. And imagine that these boxes are placed far away um, from each other, so, so they can't send signals. And in this physics experiment, we're interested in the input and output behavior of these boxes. So each box receives uh, an input um, and they produce an output. And we can describe uh, their behavior using uh, a conditional probability distribution, P of AB given XY. So it describes um, the, uh, the distribution of outputs AB given their inputs XY. And uh, to capture the constraint that these boxes are placed far away from each other and they can't send signals, uh, this correlation, this probability distribution has to satisfy some non-signaling constraints. So for example, if you look at the marginal distribution of the box A's output, A, given X, Y, uh, it should be the same regardless of what Y is. Okay? It should only depend on the value of the input X. Okay? And similarly, uh, there's a similar constraint for uh, the box on the right. Okay, so, so this is a general uh, way of talking about uh, non-signaling um, behavior between uh, faraway uh, physical systems. Um, and uh, the question here is, what non-signaling correlations are allowed in nature? Well, this depends on uh, what model of physics uh, you believe in. So um, in a classical universe, uh, we have um, what we call classical correlations. So the simplest type of a classical correlation is a deterministic correlation. And this is where the outputs, A and B, are deterministic functions of the inputs. So um, A is some function f of x, and B is some function g of y for some functions f and g. Um, and uh, this gives rise to these um, deterministic correlations, P. Uh, more generally, uh, we can allow convex combinations of these deterministic correlations. And that's what we call a classical correlation. So these are the types of correlations that uh, classical physics uh, would be interested in. All right. Well, we know that um, you know, the universe is not classical, but it's governed by quantum mechanics. And there, um, the theory of quantum physics uh, says that there's a, a richer um, a class of correlations that, uh, uh, that arise in nature. So, in quantum physics, it's possible for these two boxes to share uh, entangled quantum particles. Okay, um, and so you know, just imagine that a box here has some, say, some electron, and and the the box on the right has another electron. And even though they're they're placed very far apart, um, the behavior of this uh, these electrons can be uh, correlated in, in some very special way. Um, and the types of correlations that arise uh, we call quantum correlations. And quantum physics has a, a mathematical way of modeling these, these correlations. Um, in particular, it's given by this formula that the, the, out, you know, the distribution of outputs, P of AB given XY, is, is given by uh, uh, this expression here. And uh, what are these things? Well, it's, you know, there's some choice of dimension D. Okay, so think of D as, as specifying, you know, how many possible states each individual particle can be in. And there's some unit vector uh, in the tensor product of you know, CD tensor CD. Okay? So it's some uh, uh, complex vector uh, in D squared dimensional space that describes the state of these two particles together. Okay? And uh, you also specify something called measurement operators. Okay, so uh, these are matrices, you know, AX, you know that are indexed by the uh, inputs and outputs. Um, and each of these matrices, uh, they're D by D, uh, they're positive semi-definite, um, and they satisfy the constraint that uh, if you fix an input, say, if you fix an input X here, uh, the sum of these uh, A matrices over all possible outputs A yields the identity matrix. So this is uh, uh, just some uh, mathematical rules for how we uh, describe the quantum behavior of these two boxes. Okay. Um, and 
uh, it turns out that um, in this way, this is still a non-signaling correlation, okay? uh, even though these uh, two particles might be uh, quantum entangled. Okay, um, okay so, so this is what we call finite dimensional quantum correlations. And, um, and there's this famous paper from uh, 1935 by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, where they were thinking about these quantum correlations, um, and they were uh, pretty weirded out by it. And so they asked, uh, is there a classical explanation for these uh, spooky quantum correlations? Okay. Uh, could you describe uh, these quantum correlations using classical ones? And uh, 30 years later, Bell uh, gave a resounding answer, and he said, uh, no, it's not possible. Uh, and uh, there's a very simple way of, of seeing this fact. And the way he explained it is through something uh, called the CHSH game. Okay, so in this game, uh, we now think of the, block, the boxes as cooperating players that we call provers. And these two boxes interact with a verifier. So the verifier is some experimenter, say. Uh, the boxes, uh, again, they, they can't communicate. Um, and uh, in the CHSH game, uh, before the game starts, uh, the provers will choose a correlation P, okay? And we call this correlation a strategy, all right? Um, and then when the game starts, uh, the verifier is going to choose two bits, X and Y, uniformly at random. And the verifier sends X to one of the boxes, to one of the provers, and Y to uh, another prover. Uh, and um, uh, the provers use their correlation, their strategy, to sample uh, a pair of outputs A and B. Okay, and they send the, uh, the answers uh, back to um, the verifier. And the verifier accepts if the sum of the, the, the two output bits, okay, so A and B are, out, uh, are single bits, is equal to the product of their inputs modulo 2. So those are the, the rules of the game. It's uh, pretty simple. So now you can ask, well, what are the prover's maximum success probability? Well, it depends on what types of uh, strategies they use. Um, we can define what is called the classical value of the CHSH game. Okay, and this is the best winning probability of the, the two provers um, if they use a classical correlation. And this is denoted by omega sub C, C for classical of the CHSH game. And it's not too hard to see that um, the best uh, winning probability for classical correlations is uh, three quarters. Okay? In fact, this is achieved just by the, the boxes outputting zero all the time. Um, but uh, if the boxes use a quantum correlation, uh, then their best uh, winning probability, which we call the quantum value, is higher than three quarters. It's, uh, this cosine squared pi over eight, which is um, about 0.85. And we denote this using omega Q of CHSH. Um, and so this is uh, a winning probability that quantum physics predicts uh, that is strictly better than uh, what is possible classically. Uh, so the correlations that um, uh, quantum physics uh, gives you uh, cannot be um, achieved by uh, classical physics. And this, this optimum quantum value is achieved using a very simple quantum strategy. Uh, there's a two qubit state um, that these two devices share, these two boxes share. And uh, the measurements that they perform on uh, uh, each qubit um, is, is relatively simple. Uh, you know, prover A measures in um, something called the XZ basis, and prover B measures in uh, some rotation of the XZ basis. So this is the CHSH game, um, and it, it demonstrates that uh, uh, you know, quantum physics gives access to uh, a richer set of uh, correlations. And uh, this is not some theoretical thing. Uh, the CHSH game has actually been conducted experimentally, um, and it's, uh, also, you know, it's uh, part of something known as a, a, a Bell test. Um, and uh, you know, as an example, you know, in 2015, um, there was this, uh, the CHSH game, you know, was performed on uh, this campus of TU Delft uh, in the Netherlands, um, and where you know these two boxes are placed, uh, you know, over a kilometer apart, 
um, and they were interacting with this uh, verifier in the middle. And they played this game and they observed uh, a winning probability uh, strictly greater than 75%, um, which tells you that there are some non-classical correlations going on in nature. Um, and in particular, uh, quantum physics gives the, the best explanation for this. Okay, so, so that was a CHSH game. Um, and a non-local game uh, is a, a generalization of this. You, we can think about uh, games with other types of questions and answers. Um, and so abstractly, uh, we can think of a non-local game as consisting of uh, a question distribution. So it's some distribution mu that, that tells you how to sample um, x and y. Um, and then however the, the provers are generating their answers a and b, um, there's some decision predicate D of X, Y, A, B that tells you whether um, the provers win or lose. Okay. And if you walk up with a strategy, uh, a correlation P of uh, A, B given X, Y, um, then uh, you can compute their winning probability uh, in this game. Uh, and it's given by this expression. It's a, you know, you, you sample the questions X and Y according to distribution, um, you, you, and then you check what's the probability that they produce answers A and B that satisfy the decision predicate. And uh, for a given game G, you can define its classical value, omega sub C, which you take the um, supremum of this success probability over all possible classical correlations, or you can consider the quantum value where you take the supremum over all quantum uh, correlations. And um, there's a simple relationship between these two values in that the quantum value is always at least as high as a classical value. So in other words, um, you, can, uh, you can only do uh, better using, um, you, know, you know, possibly do better using uh, quantum correlations. Henry, I've got a quick question about the previous slide. When you, when you mentioned that uh, experimentally, uh, I mean, it had been observed something you mentioned that uh, so this uh, says that the quantum, uh, well, quantum uh, physics basically explain, explained it best. Is it agreed that there is no other explanation or are there still some squabbles about maybe there is an intermediate model that would explain like that uh, long-term probability better? Uh, um, I, I think the, by far the general consensus is that quantum mechanics gives the best possible one. I, I do think that s some people do consider uh, possibly other explanations, but um, uh, quantum me mechanics gives the simplest uh, one, I think. Thanks. Uh, good. Okay, so, so that's, uh, so you know, now we know what a non-local game is. Uh, now we can turn to uh, complexity theory and uh, talk about MIP star. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in 2004, um, their uh, computer scientists, Cleve, Hoyer, Toner, and Wachus, they were thinking about the interplay between complexity theory and quantum information and asked the following question. Uh, what is the computational complexity of non-local games? Okay. So to make this question precise, uh, let's uh, pose a computational problem. Um, and uh, let's talk about what I call the quantum game approximation problem, or QGAP. The input to this problem is a, a description of a non-local game G. And the output uh, of this problem is you have to uh, produce a number alpha uh, that is uh, within one-tenth of the quantum value of the game. Okay. So, and one-tenth here is kind of arbitrary, but just pick some small constant. Okay. So you want to approximate uh, this, uh, uh, this quantum value. And just to be a little more uh, precise, um, how is uh, the non-local game represented? Um, so a non-local game, like I said, it comes with a question distribution and a decision predicate. Uh, but I actually want to represent it as um, a, a pair okay, uh, that consists of uh, uh, the number n in unary and a Turing machine v. So this v is, uh, we should think of it as like the verifier's source code. Okay? So it's some Turing machine that when you run it, it, it um, samples the questions from the distribution mu, um, and also can compute this predicate d of x, y, a, b. Okay, so it's just some, uh, some program. 
Uh, and this number n is the maximum number of time steps uh, that you're going to run this uh, verifier source code uh, when you're playing the, the game G. Okay. And if you happen to walk up with uh, a verifier that times out, like, you know, it doesn't halt, you know, before uh, n steps, then we just uh, let the, um, the provers uh, automatically win in that case. Okay. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the Q gap problem. We have a computational problem. And uh, if you're a complexity theorist, uh, you know, there should be uh, a bunch of questions that immediately come to mind. Um, one is, okay, is there an algorithm to solve this computational problem? Uh, if there is an algorithm, what's the fastest one, right? Uh, or, you know, if you can solve this problem, what other problems can you solve? And uh, can uh, QGAP be reduced to solving some other problem, right? So these are the natural questions that you would ask as a complexity theorist, um, and this, um, brings me to the complexity class MIP star. And this stands for multi-prover interactive proofs with entangled provers. Uh, the star indicates that the provers are entangled. Um, so uh, just to be clear, the, the only quantum thing that is going on um, is uh, that the provers are uh, assumed to share quantum entanglement, but the, the verifier in this, uh, these interactive proofs uh, is, is still a classical machine. All the communication is classical. I won't formally define um, uh, the multi-prover interactive proof model, uh, but an equivalent way of, of uh, understanding what this class is, is it's a class of problems that can be efficiently reduced to QGAP, uh, the problem of approximating the quantum value of non-local games. Okay. So we've defined a complexity class. Uh, and now let's try to relate it to other complexity classes that we know, like P, NP, exponential time, uh, and so on. So uh, just to give a, a, a very simple example of how we might uh, try to relate MIP star to, um, uh, to other complexity classes, here's sort of a, like an almost trivial example, right? So I'm going to show that NP is contained in MIP star, all right? So uh, the canonical NP complete problem is uh, three set. So uh, the question is, um, someone walks up with the uh, three set formula phi and asks, is it satisfiable? Uh, so I'm going to show how we can reduce three set uh, to um, a non-local game. So it's going, uh, we're going to uh, come up with a non-local game G sub phi that encodes this uh, satisfiability problem. And uh, it's, it's actually kind of a very dumb game. Uh, the verifier here does not send any questions at all to the two provers. Um, and in fact, it ignores one of the provers. Okay, so it only awaits an answer from one of them. And the answer is uh, this A should just be a satisfying assignment uh, to this um, three set formula phi if it exists. The verifier receives this uh, assignment A and just checks does it actually satisfy phi? And if so, then it accepts and the, the provers win, otherwise, the provers lose. So it's a very simple game, um, but you can see that uh, you know, with this transformation, if phi is satisfiable, then uh, the quantum value of this, uh, uh, this non-local game is one. I mean, there's no quantum involved because um, you know, the, the prover on the left will just send a satisfying assignment. On the other hand, if phi is unsatisfiable, then uh, the quantum value is zero because there's nothing that the provers can say that will convince the verifier. Um, that uh, phi is satisfiable. Okay, um, so this is a, a, a simple reduction, um, but it, it tells you already that approximating the quantum value of a non-local game, uh, even to plus or minus one over 10, um, means that you can decide if phi is satisfiable. So this tells you that this problem, this QGAP problem is not a simple problem to solve. If you can solve it, you can solve NP complete problems. So the reason that um, you know, people studied MIP star, uh, it's, it's motivated by um, this complexity class MIP that has been studied uh, for a very long time in, in classical complexity theory. Okay, so this is uh, multi-prover interactive proofs with classical provers. And analogously, there's a, uh, an equivalent way of thinking about it, which is it's the set of problems that you can efficiently reduce to uh, C gap, right? So you, here you want to approximate the classical value uh, of a game. And one of the uh, famous results in complexity theory is due to Babai, Fortnow, and Lund in the 90s. Um, and they showed that this problem, uh, or this complexity class MIP, 
is uh, equivalent to an ex non-deterministic exponential time. So uh, essentially what they showed uh, is, um, you know, there's an efficient reduction from uh, some problem. So let's say you want to determine whether an exponential size graph, okay, you're given uh, some succinct description of this graph, okay, um, whether it's three colorable. This is a, a, an example of an NX complete problem. Uh, and they showed that you can efficiently uh, create a description of a game G sub X, where if X is true, like if this graph is three colorable, then the, the classical value uh, of this game is one. But if X is false, if uh, this graph is not three colorable, then the classical value of this game is at most a half. Um, and so therefore, if you could just, you know, if you can approximate the classical value, um, uh, then you could determine whether X is true or not. Uh, but then you'd be solving an NX complete problem. All right, so, so that's the um, uh, classical MIP. And uh, the natural question is, well, how, do these, uh, how does classical MIP versus MIP star compare? And uh, this is a very non-obvious question. Um, so first, you might wonder, is MIP contained in MIP star? Okay. Um, and the, the issue with, uh, with this is that soundness may no longer be preserved. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, you would hope that maybe this, this BFL reduction from NX to uh, uh, this uh, game G uh, would also show that um, NX is contained in MIP star. So uh, in, on one hand, suppose X was true. We know that the classical value is one. And since the quantum value is always at least the classical value, this means that the quantum value, uh, yeah, it's also gonna be one. But the issue is that if X is false, it's not immediately clear what the quantum value is. Okay, we know it's at least a half, but it, it could be equal to one, in which case then there's no gap between um, the, the true and false cases. And, and so it, we don't have a, a good reduction from, from uh, X to, um, this, uh, to deciding, you know, approximating the quantum value of non-local games. Right, so the, the first breakthrough in this area is due to um, uh, Ido and Vidic in 2012, where they showed that actually uh, it's all right. So MIP is contained in MIP star. And, uh, and the proof is that um, for the specific games that were constructed uh, uh, by Babai, Fortnow, and Lund, uh, the quantum value is approximately the same as the classical value. So if you go through this reduction again, we actually do have a good reduction. So in the, in the yes case, uh, the quantum value of this game is one. And in the no case, it's still going to be close to a half, right? So, so this shows that um, if you could distinguish between the quantum values, or if you could, yeah, uh, approximate the quantum values, then, then you can solve this original question of whether this exponential size graph is uh, three colorable. Um, all right, so, so that's for, uh, you know, for a lower bound. Well, let's talk about the uh, upper bounds. Okay, so, so I guess this, this shows that, um, you know, this MIP contained in MIP star shows that entanglement does not reduce the complexity of, of multi-prover interactive proofs, but could it expand it? So, uh, so this takes us to the question of upper bounds, right? So, you know, is there an algorithm to solve Q-gap? to approximate quantum value of non-local games. So let's think about the, the classical case again. Um, there's a trivial algorithm uh, to solve uh, the classical analog. And here, this is where you exhaustively search over prover strategies. Okay, so if someone uh, presents uh, to you a, um, uh, uh, a non-local game and ask what's the best classical strategy, it turns out you only have to optimize over all possible deterministic strategies, okay? Um, and uh, this can be done in doubly exponential time. So as just a, the crudest upper bound that you could come up with, this shows that MIP is contained in uh, double exponential time. So, so there's some upper bound, it's at least computable, okay? But it's unclear if this same exhaustive search strategy works for um, the Q-gap problem. 
And uh, you know, the reason is uh, because you know, the space of prover strategies uh, is infinite. And furthermore, it's infinite in two different ways. One is that it's, it's uh, you know, first of all, you're, uh, the space is continuous, right? So uh, if you remember, um, these quantum correlations uh, are, you know, come from, you know, you have this unit vector that describes the, the state of uh, the, the, the two boxes, and you have all these uh, matrices that describe their measurements. Hey, this is a continuous space. Um, so that's not so much an issue because you can always discretize it. Um, the more fundamental barrier is that uh, there's no known upper bound on the dimension of uh, strategy needed to win optimally, uh, even approximately. So, you know, this, for example, the unit vector needed to describe the state of the quantum state of the two boxes, um, it's some unit vector in c to the d tensor c to the d. Well, how big does d need to be? So uh, if you were to try to do the, you know, the naive exhaustive search uh, approach, um, you would first start with, you know, maybe you would search over all quantum strategies of dimension one and see what's the best you could achieve and then uh, move to dimension two and three and, and so on. Uh, but you wouldn't know where to stop a priori. Okay. Um, right, so, so this is a, a very unclear. Um, and, uh, so now this takes me to something called Cyrilson's problem. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, before I go on, are there any questions? Okay. Um, so, so let's talk about Cyrilson's problem. And so let's, let's, you know, we talked about complexity, so let's put it aside and uh, let's Henry, go... uh, one sec, I think uh, Madhu has a question. Let me unmute, or you unmute yourself. Yeah, feel free to ask. Hi, uh, I have a question. So, um, is there a reason why you consider only additive approximations to the quantum volume of a game and not like multiplicative approximations or something? Uh, you could also consider um, uh, multiplicative or like, you know, even approximations that go to zero with, say, the, the instance size. Um, but just as like the crudest, uh, you know, uh, question, you know, the, the easiest question you, you might try to solve is say like the, just the multiplicative one. Uh, sorry, the, the, the additive one. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we talked about, uh, you know, this complexity problem. Well, let's, let's put it aside for a second. And now um, let's think about, uh, you know, foundations of quantum physics. Um, so, so here we're going to talk about uh, models of quantum entanglement. And um, I defined you know, quantum correlations, but actually uh, it turns out that um, there's different models of quantum correlations that uh, people have considered. One is called the tensor product model, which is actually the model we, we, um, we defined in the beginning. And there's this other one known as the commuting operator model. Okay. So, in this tensor product model, this is just what I described. This is the finite dimensional quantum strategies, right? There's some unit vector that in finite dimensions that describes their state, and there's these d-dimensional matrices that describes their measurements, and there's this formula that tells you how to compute uh, the correlations. Um, and we can collect all of these uh, correlations and put them into a set that I'll call C sub Q. Okay. Um, there's a more general model of quantum correlations that uh, you can consider, and this is called the commuting operator model. And it's almost the same, except uh, it's not necessarily finite dimensional. So here we have a unit vector from uh, some, something called the Hilbert space. Okay, so this is some complex vector space uh, that could be infinite dimensional. Um, and there's just one space to describe uh, both of these boxes together. Okay, there's not a, you know, so before we had a space C to the D describing the space of one device and uh, C to the D describing the space of a, another device and you tensor them together to get the, the joint space. Um, but in the commuting operator model, there's just one space H describes the whole thing. Um, and uh, you have a, a unit vector that describes their state and their measurement operators are 
uh, these possibly infinite dimensional linear operators, uh, you know, A and B, that act on this space H. And the constraint on these uh, matrices is that the, uh, on these operators is that AXA commutes with BYB for all possible choices of inputs and outputs. Okay. So here we don't have a tensor product, we just multiply the, uh, the operators together. Uh, but the order in which you multiply them uh, doesn't matter because they commute. Um, so this is the uh, commuting operator model. Uh, and uh, this gives rise to a different set of correlations. And you can collect all of those p's and put them into a set that we'll call C sub QC for quantum commuting. OK, so, so what do we know about these two models? Well, uh, C sub Q, these tensor product uh, correlations, is contained in the set of uh, commuting operator correlations. Okay. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, so this commuting operator model is um, more general. And uh, this tensor product model, this, this finite dimensional uh, 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 correlations, it's, it's sort of the natural way that you would model separated systems um, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So this is in the setting where, you know, things are moving not, near light speeds, uh, but they're, um, you know, sort of like everyday quantum mechanical things. Um, and you describe their uh, uh, quantum correlations in, in that setting uh, using this tensor product model. The quantum, uh, the commuting operator model is uh, something that comes up when you're thinking about quantum field theory. So this is in the relativistic setting where sort of things are moving near light speeds and so on. Um, and in uh, this framework called algebraic quantum field theory, um, it's, not uh, you know a priori obvious how to you know describe separated uh, systems or or causally independent systems with their own state spaces right so the, it, there's no you know obvious tensor product uh, structure um, and so uh, all that you can say is that the the measurements of one system uh, commute with the measurements of the other system. And uh, when they commute, this, this tells you that they uh, can't send signals to each other because it means that the order in which they make their measurements don't matter. Okay. Um, so there's these two different models. Uh, and OK, so, so I'm going to define one more uh, set of correlations, which I'll call uh, CQA. And this is going to be the closure of C sub Q. And uh, this captures all correlations that can be approximated arbitrarily well by um, uh, finite dimensional uh, correlations. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, another um, fact is that if you look at the commuting operator correlations, and if you look at the uh, space H, if it's finite dimensions, it actually reduces to um, uh, it actually turns out that uh, uh, finite dimensional commuting operator correlations are finite dimensional tensor product correlations. So if there is a difference between the two, it only happens in the infinite dimension um, scenario. OK, so, so I've defined these correlation sets. And uh, this leads us to Searleson's problem, uh, which asks, is the closure of the finite dimensional uh, correlations equal to uh, the commuting operator correlations? Or another way to put it is, can all infinite dimensional commuting correlations be approximated by finite dimensional ones? And so this is a question that came up uh, in, uh, in quantum information and in, uh, uh, quantum physics. Um, in, uh, and uh, uh, people discovered uh, in the, um, you know, in the uh, 2000s that this problem is actually equivalent to the Kahn embedding problem. Okay, and this was shown through a sequence of works by, you know, uh, starting from uh, Kirschberg in the 90s, um, and then more recently, uh, Fritz, uh, Jung et al., and uh, Ozawa. Uh, they showed this equivalence. Okay. So we have this link between the Kahn embedding problem, which is this uh, you know, operator algebra's question, um, with this question in, in quantum information, which considers these two different models of, of quantum correlations. Okay. Uh, so now let me connect uh, these correlation sets with games. Um, so going back to uh, these non-local games, uh, the quantum value and, uh, of a game is this optimization problem uh, over this closure, CQA, right? So you, uh, you basically maximize over this uh, set. And it, it turns out that these sets are convex, 
Okay, so this is really a, some convex optimization problem, um, and uh, you're uh, you know trying to maximize a linear functional over these convex sets. That's what uh, this uh, this number is. Um, and you know you can also think about something called the commuting operator value, uh, in uh, which uh, you're you know you're trying to maximize the the value of the game over all possible commuting operator strategies. Okay, so so commuting is at least as good because um, uh, you know, every uh, you know, tensor product strategy is a commuting operator strategy. And if the two sets were the same, if Cyrilson's problem has a yes answer, this would imply that these uh, two values are, are the same for all non-local games G. Okay, so now we have this, uh, 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 the connection between the con embedding problem and Cyrilson's problem, and uh, we'll go back to complexity theory. So it turns out that the yes answer to Seelson's problem implies an algorithm uh, for this Q gap problem. And this algorithm combines two procedures, which I'll call search from below and search from above. Uh, so, so what are these uh, two procedures? Well, the search from below is uh, the easiest to describe. So it's some procedure that computes uh, a never ending sequence of numbers, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, that are all lower bounds on the this quantum value of the game. So uh, alpha d, it's going to be some epsilon approximation to the best d-dimensional strategy uh, for this game. Okay, so think of epsilon as say one tenth or something. And for every fixed d, uh, you can compute uh, this approximation just by uh, say searching over an epsilon net over all possible d-dimensional correlations. Um, and one thing that we know is that as you increase d to infinity, the sequence of numbers alpha d eventually approaches the uh, quantum value of the game. So this is the search from below. You, you, know, you run this procedure um, and it's, you know, it's this naive brute force approach. Uh, and as d uh, gets larger and larger, you get closer and closer um, to omega q. But the problem is you don't necessarily know how close you've gotten for any particular d. The other procedure, the search from above procedure, uh, goes the other way. So it computes an infinite sequence of numbers, um, uh, beta one, beta two, beta three, that are uh, non-increasing. These are all upper bounds on the commuting operator value of this game. So what is uh, beta d? Well, it's the best upper bound on the commuting operator value of the game that you can certify by a sum of squares of degree D polynomials and non-commutative variables. Uh, so it sounds kind of abstract, but uh, the wonderful thing is that this beta D is also computable and it's computable via a semi-definite program. And this was shown in 2008 by um, uh, a pair of papers, uh, Navasquez, uh, Peroni, Lassine, and also by Doherty, Liang, Toner, and Boehner. And it also turns out that as you increase D to infinity, uh, this sequence of numbers beta d will converge to this commuting operator value from above. Okay, so let's put the two together. So here's our algorithm uh, for the Q gap problem, assuming that Cyrilson's uh, problem has a yes answer. So this algorithm is going to interleave uh, the two procedures, search from above and search from below. It's going to compute this alpha d uh, and beta d for every d. And if at any point these two numbers come within one tenth of each other, it will output, uh, say, beta d. All right, so suppose that Cyrilson's problem had a yes answer. So these two correlation sets were the same. That would imply that the quantum value and the commuting operator value of this non local game are equal. And that would tell you that these two procedures would output numbers that eventually converge, they get close to each other. And this would tell you that, uh, you know, you would eventually home in on the true value, um, this quantum value that'd be, uh, you know, plus or minus some, uh, say, one over 10. So you would eventually know when you found the correct value. Um, the only issue is that you don't have any guarantee on the convergence rate, uh, but that's okay. We, I mean, we were just looking for um, some algorithm uh, that terminated its in finite time. Okay. Uh, so assuming this uh, question about, um, you know, some, some answer to the, uh, this question about uh, quantum correlations, we'd actually obtain an algorithm. 
All right, so uh, any questions about um, uh, the algorithm that I just described? Okay, so, so now let me turn to uh, the halting problem. So there's another class, complexity class called RE, okay? And um, it's uh, sort of defined by uh, the halting problem, which uh, is the problem of if we, someone gives you a Turing machine, determine if it halts eventually. And um, we know from you know, the days of Turing that uh, there's no algorithm to, to solve the halting problem. And RE is the class of all problems that are reducible to the halting problem. Uh, and basically the best upper bound that we know on MMP star uh, uh, that uh, we've, we've known was that, uh, is that it's contained in RE. If you can solve the halting problem, then you can solve Q gap. Uh, and this basically comes from uh, the fact that you can, um, you know, you just run the search from below procedure. And if it halts, uh, then you know that, uh, you know, you, you know, the value has gone above a certain threshold. And if it never halts, then that tells you it's, the value is always below the, the threshold. And, you know, as, uh, you know, the title suggests, uh, we prove that uh, MIP star is equal to RE. Um, and we give an efficient reduction from the halting problem to Q gap. And so this explains why RE was the best upper bound that we knew on MIP star. Uh, so we give a reduction where you start with a Turing machine M, uh, we can compute uh, a description of a non-local game G sub M, where if M halts, then the quantum value of the game is one. And if M does not halt, the quantum value of the game is at most a half. Um, okay, so, so how do we, how do we, uh, uh, oh, okay, so right, so we reduce, you know, uh, the halting problem to Q gap. Um, and this one half, again, it's, it's some arbitrary constant. It can be replaced by anything uh, less than one. Um, so, so let's put, you know, all the, the implications uh, there's together. There's one question, I think, from uh, Clement. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what exactly do you mean by efficient reduction here? What, are, what kind of efficiency are you looking for in the reduction? Oh, good. Uh, so it's efficient uh, in the description length of M. So the, the reduction works polynomial time in, in the description size of M. Thanks. Okay, so, so MIP star uh, equals RE. So, the, you know, since we know the halting problem is, is not uh, solvable, it's not decidable, that tells you that there's also no algorithm to solve this Q gap problem. And in particular, it means that this search from below and search from above algorithm won't converge for all non-local games G. And what that tells you is that uh, that means there must be some non-local game G for which the, the quantum value and the commuting operator value are different. So these two correlation sets cannot be the same. So this gives a negative answer to Searleson's problem. Uh, and therefore, by the, the known implications, this uh, tells you that uh, there's a negative answer to the con embedding problem. So, you know, so what are some of the consequences of this? Um, well, uh, there's a bunch of interesting ones. Uh, so the first one is that, um, you know, uh, a complexity theoret theoretic one, which is that a classical verifier interacting with two quantum entangled provers can verify that a Turing machine halts, uh, which is, uh, you know, and, and furthermore, the efficiency of this verifier uh, only depends on the description length of the Turing machine, and it does not depend at all on how long it takes for this Turing machine to, to halt, if it, if it does halt. So, um, you know, maybe one way to try to, uh, you know, appreciate uh, what this could mean uh, is, uh, so here's a concrete application uh, that was uh, suggested to me by uh, Prasad Raghavendra, and, which is that, you know, suppose aliens came to Earth and claimed that the Riemann hypothesis were true. But, you know, even describing the length of this proof would take too long, right? Like, you know, you don't even have enough bits in your head to store, like, the, the, the length of uh, this proof. Uh, but by running a, a MIP star protocol, by running some interactive uh, proof uh, with these aliens, you could verify uh, that uh, the Riemann hypothesis were actually true. 
And uh, the complexity of this verification only depends on the length of the statement of the Rima hypothesis. So, uh, uh, so that's uh, one cool consequence. Uh, and uh, the, you know, there are also these consequences for uh, mathematical physics. So in particular, it implies um, that there's uh, you know, infinite dimensional commuting operator correlations that cannot be approximated by any finite dimensional quantum correlation. And uh, this uh, also just suggests that there's, you know, in some sense, a, a Bell test, uh, not just for quantum entanglement, but whether there is infinite dimensional uh, entanglement. Uh, and so that's uh, one consequence. Another consequence is uh, for, you know, back for um, uh, operator algebras is that there exists, you know, these type two one factors that do not embed in an ultra power of the hyperfinite two one factor. Okay, so. So now let me uh, turn to how we prove this reduction. And it comes through something uh, called uh, uh, compression of non-local games. So uh, let me introduce some, uh, some quick notation. Okay. So uh, I wanna give a way of uniformly specifying an infinite family of non-local games. Okay, so let's say we have some family G1, G2, up to G3 and so on. Let's say that these, this family of non-local games is uniformly generated by some Turing machine G hat. Uh, if you provide this Turing machine uh, an index N and it outputs a description of the, the nth non-local game. Okay. So, uh, so that's what we mean by uniform uh, generation. And separately, uh, I uh, want to talk about something called an entanglement lower bound. So this is denoted by E of G comma P. And this is the minimum dimension entanglement needed to achieve success probability P in this game G. So as an example, let's say you take the CSSH game that I described in the beginning. Um, to achieve winning probability three quarters, you don't need any entanglement at all because there's a classical strategy that, that does this. If you wanted to achieve this cosine uh, squared of pi over eight, you need a, a dimension two strategy, right? So you need these, this, this two qubit uh, strategy. Uh, and if you wanted to achieve value one, uh, well, there's, there's no strategy that achieves it. So uh, we say that the you know, minimum dimension is defined to be infinity. Okay. Okay, so, so that's some notation. Uh, so the, the, the main technical heart of this reduction from the halting problem uh, to uh, this Q gap is this compression theorem, which says the following. So there's some uh, computable map compress, okay, where if you come up to me with a Turing machine G hat that specifies an infinite family of non-local games G sub n, and you feed this Turing machine G hat into compress, it's going to output another Turing machine F hat that specifies a new family of games um, F sub n. Uh, where, you know, what's the relationship between, you know, F hat and G hat? Well, these games f of n are, in some sense, a compressed version of g sub n. So the verifier complexity in f of n is, is much, much smaller than the verifier complexity in g sub n. In fact, it's poly log. Okay. So uh, the verifier is much more efficient. If the quantum value of the original game g sub n is equal to 1, then the quantum value of this, this compressed game f sub n is also 1. And we have a condition on the entanglement needed to play F sub n. If you want to succeed with probability a half, then either the, the entanglement shared by the two provers is at least n, or uh, it, you know, it's the max of it's either n or the, uh, the amount of entanglement needed to play the original game G sub n to, to win with probability more than half. So uh, this is really the, the key thing that we prove. And uh, let's see how we can use this to, to get this reduction from the halting problem to Q gap. And this is where we do, do this recursive compression uh, construction. So fix your favorite Turing machine M. This is the Turing machine that you want to know what, whether it halts or not. So I'm going to define a family of games, G sub N, okay, and it's going to be uniformly generated by G hat. So here's the, you know, how G sub n behaves. 
Okay, so fix a, a, an n. So in G sub n, this is what the verifier is going to do. It's first going to, before even talking to the players, it's going to run this Turing machine m for n time steps. And if within this time, uh, the Turing machine halts, then uh, the verifier is just going to say, okay, everyone wins, uh, the game's over. Uh, otherwise, uh, the verifier is going to compute uh, the compression of g hat, right? So g hat specifies you know, this whole family of games. It's going to self-referentially -referen compute the compression. So it computes f hat. And then it's going to play the n plus first non-local game, f. Okay, so this is kind of a weird non-local game. Let, let's try to think about uh, uh, you know, what's, what's going on here. So uh, what is the quantum value of g sub n? We want to analyze this. So there's two cases. Let's say that this Turing machine m actually halts, and it halts in some time t. So here I sort of depicted you know, the, the infinite family of games g sub n. And so for all indices n that are greater than this time t, we know that the quantum value of this game is equal to 1, right? Because we know that this Turing machine halts in within n time steps. And so the, the verifier is going to automatically accept. So, so the value is just going to be 1. But for all n that's less than t, the, the quantum value of this game g sub n well, notice that step one always just passes to steps two and three because M hasn't halted yet in this time bound. So really, we're just playing the uh, game Fn plus one. So the, the value of this game G sub N is the same as the value of Fn plus one. Okay, so, so if we, you know, for example, think about, uh, you know, G sub T minus one, it's, its behavior is the same as F sub uh, T. But by the compression theorem, you know, f sub t is just a compressed version of g sub t. And we know that the value of g sub t is 1. OK, so, so this tells us that g sub t minus 1 has value 1. So you can sort of see where this is going. You know, by inductively proceeding, you can argue that g sub t uh, minus 2 has, also has value 1, and, and so on. And you actually deduce that for all n, uh, the quantum value of all these games is, is 1 in the case that m halts. All right, so, so what about um, the case that m never halts? So, uh, so we, this step 1 here, it, it's, it, it never accepts, so we can just ignore it. So we know that um, the game g sub n is, is the same as the game fn plus 1 always for all possible n. So in particular, it means that the entanglement required to play this game uh, gn plus 1 to win with a probability better than a half is the same as the entanglement lower bound for fn plus 1. So what we show is that there's no finite dimensional strategy uh, that can achieve uh, success probability greater than a half in, in the game g sub 1, where index is equal to 1. And here's the proof. Right, we just uh, first look at the compression theorem, which says that you know, how much entanglement is needed to play f sub n. Uh, it says that it's uh, the max of n and the e of g sub n. So it's at least e of g sub n. Okay. And if you put you know, this, this statement plus this statement, right, and you chain them together, you, you see that the entanglement needed to play uh, g sub n is always at least the entanglement needed to play entang uh, you know, g sub n plus 1. And just by iterating, you see that the entanglement needed to play g sub 1 is at least uh, e of g sub n for all n. Okay. But how much entanglement is needed to play e of g sub n? Well, it's at least n plus 1, right? Because g sub n is the same as f n plus 1, and we know how much entanglement is needed to play this. So this tells us, you know, for, since it's at least uh, n plus 1 for all n, it's actually, there is no finite bound on the entanglement needed to play g sub 1. Uh, so there's no finite dimensional strategy that can, that can play this game uh, with better than uh, probability half. 
So this, this completes the, the reduction, right? We have this game. Uh, if you let g sub n equal to g sub 1 in, in this family of games, in the case that m halts, we have value 1. In the case that it doesn't halt, it's value at most a half. So uh, any questions about uh, this recursive compression procedure? Uh, not to rush you, but I guess it's like 11 now, so you might want to think about wrapping up soon because people might have to leave. OK, sure. So, um, so, so that's the, the reduction. Um, and yeah, in the, in the last part, uh, I will just sort of mention very briefly, like you know, what is, at a very, very high level, what is the, this compression? Uh, you know, how do you actually achieve this compression? And uh, it, it builds on uh, this introspection technique of Nadarajan and Wright, who, uh, who last year used this to show that uh, NEEKS, or non-deterministic non double exponential time, is contained in MFP star. Um, and uh, essentially, the idea is that this verifier, this compressed game, uh, F sub n, wants to simulate the verifier in this, this original game, G sub n, but wants to spend less time. So here's just a, um, a cartoon version of, of uh, what's going on. Um, so, yeah. There's a question. Yeah. OK, so I wanted to ask, where did you use this polar logarithmic nature of the uh, compression? Great, uh, great question. Right, so the compression theorem states that um, F sub n runs in much smaller time than um, G sub n. And uh, this, uh, this comes from the fact that um, this compression theorem uh, needs to have some guarantee on the running time of G sub n. It needs to know that it have some upper bound on it. So uh, when I define this, uh, it allows me to say that when I define this recursive construction, uh, this, you know, this G sub n, that you know, the, the complexity of G has to include the complexity of F sub n. But since the complexity of F sub n is, is very small, uh, this allows us to bound the complexity of G sub n, which allows us to conclude that when you apply the compression theorem to G hat, you actually get some uh, guarantee. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, spell out the, the details here, but uh, that's really what where it's used to argue that um, we can actually invoke the compression theorem uh, in each of these steps. Okay, so. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, end by showing a kind of a cartoon of uh, how this, uh, you know, what's, how one should think about what's going on in this uh, compression. So let's imagine that here we have the verifier for this game F sub n. And he's, you know, he's uh, interacting with these two provers. Okay, so let's imagine that they're not allowed to communicate with each other. And the verifier says, well, I'm too lazy to ask you questions from uh, this game G sub n. I just don't have enough time. Right, I'm only running in polylog time. So instead, I want you, you know, these provers uh, to ask yourselves the questions that I would have asked in this game G sub n, and answer those questions that you asked yourselves. And then on top of that, quickly prove to me that I would have accepted your answers. And uh, you know the. You know the prover is just going to say, "Well, what, what are you? You know, why are you asking me this?" Um, so the you know the way that the you know, this F and verifier will actually verify that these two provers are going to do this uh, is uh, through a combination of something called the classical and quantum low degree test um, to really enforce the fact that these two provers will will be doing this. And, and this is the, the essential idea behind um, uh, this introspection technique. Um, Okay, so since I'm out of time, I think I'll maybe stop here and, uh, you know, if people need to leave um, or, or ask questions, um, you know, uh, can go ahead. Sure. I mean, like, honestly, uh, you know, no one's going to use the room after us. So, like, uh, perhaps, you know, if this is a good stopping point, then people can leave if they need to. But if anyone, if people, if everyone's okay with sticking around, uh, you can sort of go as long as you want, I guess. Uh, maybe, maybe not another hour, but yeah, you can keep going if you want. Yeah, I just have a few minutes left, so. Um, okay, so um, 
Right, so I, let me say just a little bit about what this uh, classical and quantum low degree test is. Uh, and really the key is uh, there are these very efficient tests for entanglement that are really powering this introspection uh, technique. So the CHSH game that I described at the beginning, um, it's a, a, a simple test for two-dimensional entanglement in the sense that if you play the CHSH game and uh, the, the provers are winning with probability that's close to this optimal 85%, then that actually tells you that they share uh, an entangled state that has, that's two-dimensional. Okay. And for compression, you require efficient tests for very high-dimensional entanglement. Okay. Uh, and this is where we use this thing called the quantum low degree test uh, due to Nadarajan and Vidic from a couple of years ago. And uh, it shows that there's some fixed epsilon, some positive epsilon, and a family of games, Q sub n, where there's a quantum strategy to win each of these games with probability one. And the question and answer alphabet sizes uh, are for each n is quasi polynomial in n. But the dimension needed to win, to play this game Q sub n with, and win with probability greater than one minus epsilon is at least two to the n, okay, which is much bigger than n to the poly log n. So, so this is the non-trivial, this is the reason we call it efficient. And uh, this is a, you know, the reason this result is very non-trivial is that the question and answer alphabets is much smaller than the dimension that you're, is being certified. Um, and this is sort of where the, the compression, uh, where we can get this compression uh, from. And this quantum low degree test is built on efficient tests for classical structure. And this is something that actually comes from classical complexity theory. It builds on this classical low degree test, which is a test not for quantumness, but it's a testing that the prover's answers are consistent with low degree polynomials. And this is uh, a tool that was crucial for building the uh, PCP theorem. And it also has this uh, quasi polynomial alphabet versus exponential dimension uh, feature. Right? So this, in this uh, test, the uh, question sizes and answer sizes are pretty small, but it's certifying that the prover's answers are consistent with some structure that's uh, you know, exponentially large. And um, there's an, an an analysis of the classical low degree test uh, in the presence of provers that use quantum entanglement, okay? And this is due to uh, Ido Vidic and then um, later improved by Nadarajan and Vidic. And what is this quantum low degree test? Well, it's really, in some sense, the classical low degree test in, in two complementary bases. Okay. Um, so that's all I'll say uh, about that. Um, and uh, so let me just run through a quick outline of this, what this compressed uh, game F sub n is doing. So it's going to use this quantum low degree test to first check that the provers share a, a very high dimensional entanglement uh, using short questions and answers. After that, it's going to check that the provers are using this entanglement, which is guaranteed to be there, as a source of randomness to simulate the verifier in in this game, G sub n. And that uh, the provers are actually going to answer those uh, uh, self-sampled questions uh, that this G sub n verifier would, would ask. And, that and then you know, that the questions and answers that they self-sampled uh, would have been accepted by the G sub n verifier. Okay. And all of this is done very efficiently using PCPs. So the, essentially this classical low degree test uh, to check that all of this was, was, uh, was actually performed. And so the end result is that this game F sub n forces the provers to play G sub n uh, using uh, you know, a very small amount of uh, communication. Okay. And so this was a very, very high level uh, outline, uh, but if you want more details, then you should see John Wright's uh, TCS plus talk from last summer. Uh, where he goes into this, uh, describes the details of how this introspection was actually carried out. Okay, so uh, that's it for the the talk. Um, and uh, you know, um, there there are a lot of open questions, um, but uh, I think I'll stop here. And and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.
Cool. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, yeah, like he said, uh, we have, uh, I mean, yeah, people can ask questions. Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask anything you want at this point. Hey, sorry, I've got one more question about the previous slides. So in the general roadmap, uh, where exactly uh, do you actually use exact uh, entanglement as compared as uh, shared randomness? The first step, would that be enough to have just public randomness between the proofs, for example? Right. Um, so, so the key is that um, this verifier, this G sub n, uses exponentially more randomness than what F sub n has access to. Um, and the, uh, you know, in this game, the, the verifier for this compressed game needs to check that the provers uh, share, you know, share all this entanglement and they're going to use this entanglement uh, to generate honest uniform randomness to, to generate the questions uh, in the game G sub n. So of course, the, yeah, the, you know, the provers have their own source of randomness, but here, this, this is to verify that the randomness is used in a specific way, namely to simulate this verifier. And so the only way to do this is to use entanglement. So the entanglement is, is, uh, is really just ultimately used for a classical purpose, um, but the only way to verify that you have you know, exponentially many random bits uh, that are generated in an honest way is to test for entanglement. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Is the classical verifier in the reduction from Harting to Kruger, is that polynomial time bounded? Uh, the, you mean in the reduction from the halting problem to the, the, the non-local game? Yeah. Yeah, so the reduction is polynomial time. So the description length of this non-local game and also its running time is polynomial in the, de, in the description length of M, but it has nothing to do with how long M takes to run or, or doesn't run. But the question, my question is the verifier. What is the uh, bound on the complexity of the verifier? Of G sub M, you mean? Uh, yes, it's, it's polynomial in the description length of M. I mean, I have one more question, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, this is about this cone embedding problem. So there, uh, we are talking about embeddability of something into ultra product of something. Now, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, if I have an ultra product that depends on an ultra filter, but in some cases, the product does not actually depend on the ultra filter. So if it does depend on the ultra filter, then what it seems to be you are constructing, actually you are constructing an ultra filter. So you're showing the existence of a certain ultra filter. Is that the case? Or is it the case that what is being constructed simply doesn't depend on the particular ultra filter? I, uh... Actually, I don't really know what an ultra filter is. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> sure, we could potentially ask, uh, discuss that a bit more once uh, we take go offline. Um, any other questions? All right, with that, I guess uh, I'll sort of take us offline. So, you know, if Henry has time and other people have time, you can continue discussing. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot to Henry for giving this talk today. Um, I just want to remind people that uh, Thomas Steinke is speaking in two weeks about uh, connection between generalization and conditional mutual information. And stay tuned to our website, Twitter, uh, and so on to hear about upcoming talk announcements. Thanks a lot. <laughs>